So today we are going to discuss uh, crypto with the great crypto curator, and let's know the details of how this uh, kind of business uh, works. Paul, could you please introduce yourself and what do you do for business? Sure. Uh, my name is Paul McNeil. I'm also known as the crypto curator. Uh, I've been aware of Bitcoin since 2011, and I've been sending out a daily brief uh, for the last past three years, actually every day except for Sundays. Uh, I do that and I've been doing it for three years, so I am pretty much well versed in the space. What, what are your responsibilities or what do you do exactly as a crypto curator? Sure. So as a curator, uh, I scour the web every day looking for news articles, podcasts and videos that I believe will be relevant for people to know about. And so my brief is a very in-depth brief in that I'm collecting information across all aspects of the digital asset blockchain space. And then I put it together in a daily brief and send it out to my members. And how did you get inspired to join this business? Yeah, so my former business, and it was actually my first uh, sort of ability to get into entrepreneurship, a good friend of mine started a business curating news information. Um, our clients were most of Capitol Hill, Congress and part of the White House OSTP. And then we also provide the same service to Fortune 500 companies. And the purpose of it is so when C-level executives would come into the office, uh, they had our daily brief that they would read before their morning meeting. It would be mentions about their company, mentions about their competitors, and then mentions about whatever industry they were in. So they were all on the same page and knowledgeable about what was happening that day. And what are the latest news about crypto uh, today or yesterday? Yeah, so, I mean, there, there's a lot that's going on. Of course, the biggest news right now is that we're entering or have been in for at least the last past Past few weeks, uh, a bull market in the Bitcoin market. Bitcoin, uh, 12 years ago, started out at zero dollars. Uh, today, Bitcoin's trading about fifteen thousand uh, dollars. And so, for an asset to perform so well over time, uh, it's seen as a store of value. And along with Bitcoin. It it's not the only digital asset. There are a ton of others, about 3,000 different digital assets. But the next one closest is Ethereum. And Ethereum right now is preparing for what they call ETH 2.0, which moves it from proof of work to proof of stake. And that's, that's a big story. Well, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so um, Bitcoin is known as a proof of work blockchain. And if your, your listeners ever get a chance, just Google Bitcoin white paper. It's about nine pages. It was created by someone, a fictitious name called Shitoshi Nakamoto. Now, of course, this is not a real person. We believe Bitcoin was created by either a group of people or maybe a couple people uh, who were very knowledgeable and well-versed with digital money. Uh, the paper is called a peer-to-peer -peer electronic currency, and that's what it's supposed to be. So, uh, the reason it's called proof of work is because you need node operators and then you need miners. These miners, it's just like if you think about gold miner, right? Someone's digging in the ground and they find gold nuggets and then they go sell those gold nuggets for money. Well, with Bitcoin, miners use computers called ASICs and they mine for Bitcoin. When they find Bitcoin, they can then sell that Bitcoin for dollars. And well, what is the other way, like state of uh, proof of state? Of state? Proof of stake, yes. Yeah. So instead of, and a lot of people give Bitcoin a lot of, you know, you know, pressure because they say it, you know, uses a lot of electricity. It's bad for the environment. Even though they don't realize that the majority of Bitcoin mining is done with uh, green energy, so it's really not as bad as people think it is for the environment. But a better way, or a way that people think you can do it, other is by doing proof of stake, and this is where you have what they call node validators who will use the digital assets to run uh, an actual node. And so if I, and with Ethereum, if you use 32 Ethereum, they call them Ether, 32 Ether, you can then become a validating node on the network, which means you set up your computer, you put 32 Ether into a wallet, and then that computer must stay on and running uh, for at least a year and if you do that, you will get rewarded with more Ethereum. 
So you get more ether as a result of running this node. Now, what are you doing as a node? You're validating transactions on the network with your computer. So as a result of doing that, you're not not using up as much energy and you're also getting a reward for doing the work. Okay, from your side as an experienced um, professional in this field, how dangerous and risky is it? So with Bitcoin, it's not as dangerous as most people believe. The danger comes in what they call not your keys, not your coin. The way Bitcoin operates, think of it like you would email. I can give anyone my email address. My email address is the crypto curator at protonmail.com. Anyone can send me email anytime they want to. There's no danger in that. I then have a password that allow me access into my email. If I give out my password to that account, someone can go in and get all my email out and see all my email. I don't want that to happen. So I protect that password very strongly. With Bitcoin, you have a public key and a private key. Uh, give me one second. I'm sorry. Private key. So if your public key, you can give to anyone and say, hey, send me money to this address, but you never want people to have your private key because then they have access to your money. So that's the danger there. With staking, it's very new. It's beta, right? This is the first time this has been done. Your Ethereum could possibly get hacked. Someone could probably get it. So you have to be very careful there. Okay. So, uh, it's okay. So is Bitcoin and Ethereum and these coins the future of money? Yes, it is. I do believe it's the future of money, and I'll give you a couple reasons why. Um, we've known money to be what the central banks have, right? They, and this is the issue that we have, and this is why Bitcoin was created. Central bankers can just print money as they want to. They bring money out of nowhere and they do it. Back when the dollar was tied to gold, that wasn't the case because every dollar had to be backed by gold. Now that dollars are not backed by anything around the globe, central bankers can just constantly print more money. Bitcoin stops that. It says there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin ever to exist. However, it is fractional because every Bitcoin, the smallest unit, is called a Shatoshi, which means you have a hundred million Shatoshis in one Bitcoin. So as you look at that, if you got 21 million Bitcoin times a hundred million, it's a very large number, right? So this becomes a very stable money. It is no longer money that can just be inflated by just continual printing. And so that is why people are looking to Bitcoin now as a stable store of value initially, then it will shift to become a medium of exchange, and then it will be seen as a unit of account where you will pay for things in Shatoshis. Is this kind of coin uh, the coin or the money for the rich, the higher class? Actually, it's not. That's the beautiful thing about Bitcoin. A lot of people will look at 14,000 or 15,000 and go, wow, that's a lot. I can't afford a Bitcoin. But you can afford a Shatoshi because you can buy as little as $5, $10 worth of Bitcoin at a time. So what I believe is that if the, what people would classify as poor people, right? People that do not have a lot of resources, we have this term called well, it's not a properly used term. Dollar cost averaging is where you have a set amount of money and you spread that amount a set up period of time. But it's what it's called reoccurring purchases. I would encourage people that don't have a lot of resources, if you get an opportunity to buy $5 worth of Bitcoin, just buy $5. And if you get another $5, buy another $5. Or if you can buy $100 every week, buy $100 every week. Slowly reoccur until you can get to one Bitcoin because it truly is a better saving mechanism than it is to put in a bank account because why we're in what they call a zero interest rate or a negative interest rate policy world a zerp nerp world that you're not going to earn anything if you put your money in the bank if you have dollars sitting in the bank those dollars are not only not earning interest it's also being inflated away so the purchasing power of those dollars is dwindling every day because the fed continues to print so many more but with Bitcoin, if you saved your money in Bitcoin, that money is actually deflationary. And as I just mentioned, it started 12 years ago at zero. It's at 15,000 now. There is an analyst who says, and, and multiple analysts who believe that Bitcoin could become 300,000, 500,000, $3 million within the next 10 years. So if that does happen, 
you should be at least off zero and have some exposure than no exposure. What financial policies do you suggest need improving or changing to uh, allow these kinds of coins to uh, improve? Yes, regulation is, is going to be a huge player in this. And I think the Office of the Control of Currency, there's a person that's serving that position as an acting officer. He recently came out and said that banks could now custody digital assets. So by banks being able to custody digital assets soon, I believe banks will be able to not only custody them, but also sell and purchase digital assets. Once they're able to do that, we begin to see what I consider the financial infrastructure get shift over to blockchain. Soon we'll have more banks that'll be involved with this. We'll have more um, companies that are involved in this and people will then shift that standard. As I mentioned before, it starts off as a store value, then a medium of exchange, more merchants will begin to accept it. We need the IRS to come out and say, there's a de minimis uh, rule in the policy that says, if you're spending $600 or less in digital assets, it's not taxed. Right, because right now, if you spend dollars to get coffee, that money is not taxed. It's not capital gains tax, but with Bitcoin, it is right now. So once that rule comes into place, then you're going to see a shift from that medium of exchange to a unit of account, because then the merchants will say, "Okay, I don't need to say this coffee is five dollars. I mean, three dollars. I can say this coffee is, you know, ten shatoshis or a hundred shatoshis, and then you will see the system run on a digital platform." When do you think that uh, these kinds of coins will become the common uh, money with, for the common people? Sure, I think that's sort of happening today. Uh, they're called stable coins, actually. Every central bank is working on what they call central bank digital currencies. China has been the, well, not even the first, I take that back. The first was actually uh, in um, uh, the Bahamas. They launched their digital dollar, which is called a sand dollar. They were the first ones to launch a central bank digital currency. And then China launched theirs, DCEP, which is also their version of a CBDC. And you have countries around the world. Russia is looking at a CBDC. Um, uh, Turkey, I think, is looking at a CBDC. You have tons of nations looking at launching digital money. And people say, well, our money's already digital. We don't need digital money. But this digital money is different because it's programmable digital money. So if you launched a stable coin or if you launched a digital currency, you could program that asset for people to use in certain ways. So say the stimulus that just recently came out, the central bank could then say, I'm going to give you $1,200 in stimulus money, but you have to spend that money in the next two weeks or it's gone and they can make it leave the wallet, right? So rather good or bad, um, you have the ability to do things like that. But I think right now we're, we'll see adoption of a major stable coin or governments launching their own stable coins within the next couple of years. What else would you like to add to the topic today? Yeah, you know, this is the thing that I tell everyone. I encourage people to, because again, I'm a curator. So I know a little about a lot. But what I encourage people to do is to listen to what I listen to, watch what I watch, and read what I read. And the best way to do that is by being exposed to the briefs that I put out. Now, on my website, I do have three news articles, a video, and a podcast every day. But those are hand-curated information from me, someone who's been in the industry for 12 years, almost 11 years. I understand what people should be aware of. So if you are reading those three articles, watching that video, and listening to that podcast, you will know what to do, but you have to at least consider being off zero. I don't recommend anyone throwing a bunch of money into this without understanding what it is. That's dangerous. Don't do that. Please don't do that. Read, understand. If you want to get involved, take a little bit, $5, $10, just get some exposure. And from there, you're going to know the rest. It has been amazing talking to you, Paul, today. Thank you so much for your time indeed. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on.